And thank you for having me back. I find I was here in 2017. Thanks for placing that in historical context for me. Um, and I feel kind of the same way as I felt then, which is really unprepared to do more than scratch the surface. There are so many pathways into this and out of this particular wetland. Um, but then I remind myself that as an artist, I work with exacto blades on clay, so scratching the surface is kind of what I do for a living, and good things seem to come out of it. So at least that's how I distract myself. I was talking to someone this morning who was describing how um, being part of this has allowed, made them realize how in so many spaces that are more rigidly defined in terms of race and identity particularly, they find themselves holding their breath and that they're able to breathe more deeply in a place where, I guess you could say we're all strangers. Because where everyone is a stranger and an outsider, nobody is. So hopefully this is a place where we can breathe. Let's breathe. So many billions of creatures in the soil, in the forests, in the oceans, across this world are breathing the same pool of air at the same moment that we are. And that's how it's always been, right? And the trees breathe out what we breathe in and, and vice versa, which is pretty cool. So for some people, you're still holding your breath because we always come into spaces, especially ones that promise something new and hopeful, wondering, will I be betrayed? Will I be betrayed again? Because we know what that is. And, um, oh, get used to me crying, by the way. You know, I'm, I'm cool with it if you're cool with it. Um, who will be acknowledged in a space that's about acknowledgement? and who's going to be left out, and who's going to be left behind. Um, and that's a question that's always unanswered. But I think that part of the challenge is to act with each other in, as though we are living in the world we want to live in and not in the one we fear. That's really my challenge for myself these days, is to behave as if my own traumatic ghosts aren't actually the authority on what's going to happen, and that hopefulness does not inevitably lead to disappointment. The enemy does not always have to win that is not written. Or even it is written. And a lot of that shit that's written is lies. So, in thinking about coming here, my mind, my room, my backyard were, became really crowded with stories. So I've come here basically with a basket full of stories, questions, and speculations. And I'll just be reaching my hand into them and pulling out whatever's there until Alyssa gives me the signal to sit down. And maybe if I can avoid eye contact for a few minutes after that. <laughs> so, so when we're talking about betrayal, I want this is going to be a theme. I'm going to keep coming back to it in my remarks. And I think we need to keep betrayal aware that betrayal is in the room. There's so many ways in which that works in an oppressive society. In fact, oppressive societies require betrayal, and I'll talk a little bit about why that is and how that came to be further on. But when we're talking about how do we not betray each other, I think about Charlene Carruthers' formula in her book, Unapologetic, A Black Queer Feminist Mandate for Radical Movements. I'm still reading it. I won't pretend, I always, I'm still reading everything at once. But essentially what she says is that those who are farthest on the edges and margins of an oppressive empire basically have the best seat to see the whole thing, right? And these are the people who need to be placed in the seat of honor if we're going to move forward, right? So here I am, right, saying this um, as a light-skinned, straight, cis man with a white parent, right? But that for my story to be useful or medicinal, 
I have to be able to incorporate that awareness of you all's stories into the heart of that. And that's the difference between solidarity and betrayal. Solidarity and betrayal are twins. They're never far from each other and they're always talking to it, both talking to us at once until we learn to figure out which one we're going to listen to. And then increasingly the voice of the other starts become, fading and becoming less and less a distraction. They burned us from our villages and left them charred and smoking amidst the raging rivers and the screaming of the stars. And the children heard the wailing as the elders' hearts were broken and a token of resistance was encoded in our scars. I was born on a rainy mountain in a coffee region in the Caribbean island of Puerto Rico on a watery planet at the edge of an immense galaxy. And all of those truths were in plain sight when I was a child. The mountain was my world, the oceans were within view. And at night, when the night was clear, it lit up with the blazing glory of the Milky Way. My mother, Rosario Morales, was a working class New York Puerto Rican who, when she got together with my father, Richard Levins, an Ashkenazi New York um, Jew, they moved to the island where her three children were born. And I grew up where few cars passed each day on the little road and few electric lights were on at night and all the water that we used for any purpose was supplied by the sky. I crash landed in Chicago at 11 years old. When I was 15, I left home dropped out of high school at 16 and at 17, was working in a little factory 1,500 miles away in the furniture mills and textile mills that still existed in those days. That tells you that was probably about 100 years ago. No, it was in the 1970s, it says so right here. Decades before, they'd all be turned into boutique or boutique, whatever that means, right? But it's a good, you know, it seems to fit little fern and latte galleries and co-working spaces. In Chicago, I wandered the boundaries of white, oh, thank you. I thought you were gonna give me the five minute signal. Um, of knowing that I would, gonna, would talk for another 20 minutes. Um, the boundaries of white, black, and Puerto Rican communities and activist spaces. And I adopted a strategy that I'd learned from the lizards that hunted flies across my bedroom ceiling, which is to take on the patterns, the colors, the body language and the accents of whatever space I was in. And in every micro habitat that I moved in, I was an insider and outsider, interpreting every space I was in with the knowledge of an insider and the eyes of an outsider. Now I've made it a lifelong practice to tell myself and anyone else who will listen that things were easy, but they were not. That cat-like, I could always land on my feet extracts nutrients from the air and um, synthesize all of my identities into a seamless integrated whole. Gemini magic. Woo -woo. One of my co-workers is a fierce Gemini nationalist so may have come up, become this big deal in my workshop you know I never used to notice these things. But anyway Whatever that explains, y'all can tell me later. <laughs> anyway, there's some truth in that narrative. But it's just not the whole truth. That landing on your feet too many times, it turns out, can lead to fallen arches and a rotated pelvis. So in Puerto Rico, I could be an Americanito. In New York, the foreign kid. You know, how many times did I hear, say something in Portuguese? Um, and... In Chicago, I was an honor honorary member of whatever community I got to be a lizard in. I was even recruited in as the token spick in the Black Student Union at Kenwood High. It was best to be a lizard. So figuring out how to do these things, how to extract survival out of the streets and alleys, how to educate myself without schools, organize without mentors, and travel without money were sources of pride and confidence. But every lesson we learn can hide other truths from us. Learning the skills of a scavenger, I could always survive from week to week, but it made it difficult to learn later in life how to plan long term. Experience, I decided, is like lightning. 
The more intense your experience, the brighter the flash, and the more the landscape is revealed that would not otherwise have been revealed, but also the brighter the flash, the deeper the shadows it throws. So you might exist in the same landscape as I, but still live in a very different world, lit up by the flashes of your own and your people's lightning. Many of these worlds are in this room. Each of them burned into our bodies with the intensity of authentic experience and inherited trauma. Each of us comes here with a patchwork of knowledge, insight, and cluelessness. It's all our own. Each of us, I, so I imagine, hungry for a connection that does not demand that we pretend or exaggerate in order to be accepted. This conference is destined to be partially successful. What I mean is that the container created by the organizers will always be at least a few paces behind the always shifting landscape of identity and consciousness. And the trick is to keep the reeds that make up the container moist and flexible so it can continue to expand and shape shift according to the insights that are brought and the challenges faced. And maybe the real measure of success is the ability to always partially fail with openness and humility. Into endless exploitation, we were driven in confusion, in resistance and collusion at a price we couldn't know. Condemned to isolation in a nation of illusion, in a wasteland of pollution where the spirits will let go. Okay, where was I? What, I was only on page 17? Coming home one night from a restaurant job in Boston, walking through Cambridge, I passed MIT, um, the university, and through the window saw a martial arts exhibit going on. Um, the students were moving through the room and turning all in unison, like migrating birds. And I w went in and found my way into that room because this looked interesting to me right in time for a demo demonstration where a student lay down in the middle of the room and removed his shirt. And the teacher, the master, came out with this really big ass sword and sat in front of him. And another student placed an apple on the student's belly. And the, yeah, yeah, I see your eyes getting wide. You know where I'm leading. So this master came down with the sword whoosh, like that, sliced the apple exactly in half left the student in mint and reusable condition and seemingly not even concerned. Then the assistant student came around with a blindfold and held it up to some of us sitting around the edge to show it was the real deal, blindfolded the master and he did it again. And that's really stuck with me. There's a bunch of lessons that I keep drawing from that, but one of them has to do with precision. We are so much about overcompensation about the pendulum. If we're worried we're gonna go overboard this way, well, we tend to go overboard that way. And that really awakened in my mind the idea that actually there is another way. There is another way. We don't have to either betray people this way or betray them that way. We can find that measure. Accuracy is a necessary um, resource for any organism to survive in the wild, right? We need to know nuanced information about our environment. What if we learn to value all the nuanced information about our identities, the exact measure and weight and velocity of the different pieces that make us up? <sighs> mm. Oh, it's so good I put numbers on these things. So I think that hunger for accuracy, for knowing ourselves and knowing our environment is one of the, I call it the internal driving forces behind these conversations, behind this Minnesota mixed. Um, but it's not simple. It's not simple because of the histories that we have inherited, the histories of betrayal, the ways in which the very um, lies that have been told about our existence in all these different categories have also provided the boundaries around which we can build up the barricades that protect us and defend us. 
Um, my sister, Aurora, in her wonderful book of essays, Medicine Stories, um, describes it in the following way. Check this out, she even got her brother to do the cover. She says, for oppressed people, defining the boundaries of group membership is often a life and death decision, shaped by both the necessities of survival and the lessons in exclusion that we absorb from the masters. The more embattled a community is, the more narrowly it, it patrols its borders. As a group of people engaged in a liberation struggle builds its reservoirs of consciousness, creating room for new thinking and new social relationships, those boundaries often become permeable, and that brings its own blessings and challenges. And the barricades of our communities have been built as a way to protect ourselves, even our own mythologies, borrowed mythologies of purity, and redefining them is not something to be taken lightly. And also the opportunities for betrayal are provided by a system that thrives on them. I remember in the 1970s, um, the Nixon administration was the first to start really using Hispanic as a category because by lumping all people of Latinx heritages together, they could negotiate directly with right-wing Cubans in Miami and claim that they were speaking with all of us. And then also there's the left liberal hunger to change the subject any time that blackness is centered in a conversation. And so the idea of being able to identify people who are, and this specifically pertains to those who do have some white identity usually, um, to be able to talk to instead, to include in coalitions and say that they're talking to all people of color because not only are we exotic, but we are so intersectional, right? And I say that with a little bit of sarcasm because it's important for us to remember that our positioning that allows us to be insiders and outsiders in different communities only gives us a particular location to see the world, not the best one. That seeing the world from deep in the heart of specifically targeted communities is also reveals insights and truths that can never be gained anywhere else. We're just part of the patchwork. So I got a suggestion. Let's not betray each other. First of all, let's lead from below. And also understand that we get to define what we're doing. You know, we're, we're in battle with others who are trying to do it for us. But when I think about the history of out, like outsider spaces, I realize that that can mean many, so many different things. One, in one example, it's the Quilombos of South America, where people from so many different African and even other nationalities came together in the forest to create liberated republics and forge new identities. But then also I think of the um, port cities of the Caribbean, port cities that have always historically thrived on the docks in a mixture of so many different identities that the basic categories themselves were so obviously experienced as absurd in every relationship and interaction, and these spaces became one of the heartbeats of the struggle for abolition throughout the hemisphere. We can decide which of these are going to be. Are we going to be liberated territories, or are we going to be... Um, what our enemies and our loving critics fear us to be. There's one fear-based concern that, to talk about, that talking about mixture is simply the effort of white mothers of dark children to give their kids a free pass out of the burdens of racism. And of course, all of these things, there's truths and there's lies all mixed up together. But it's always a mistake to let the enemy define who we are, what our strategy is, and what we believe our prospects are. For me personally, mixture is experienced in the intermediate zone between nationality and race. And the reality that my racial identity could be transformed by others just by getting off of an airplane, as my sister put it, um, means that that's at the center of my own narratives and how I approach mixture. But that's where my lightning flash has revealed things to me. And there's places where it does not. There's, for others, the rigid categories that your very existence defies 
can fall along lines of physical or mental difference, gender fluidity or diversity, adoptive identity. But naturally, it's my own experience that I feel qualified to talk about. I'm just deciding what not to say. See, I'm checking out the clock. Any suggestions are welcome. So, so one of the things that we, because of the dominance of whiteness in spaces that control communication and perception, it's so easy for us to, some of us anyway, to be absorbed into its toxicity. That, for example, through the white world lens, nothing can exist without whiteness, right? You know, to me, liberated spaces is actually, we don't necessarily even talk about them, folks. But that means that for them, the, the historical existence of spaces where um, Guatemalan, Palestinian, Bangladeshi, black, Passamaquoddy, Khmer, and other people have always mixed throughout history become invisible because the white folks aren't in the picture. Right? But we've been mixing long before there were racial categories. Right? That's what we do. It just wasn't race mixing because that didn't exist. We were people mixing, right? And we're still doing that. Um, so I want to go to one of the historical nuggets I promised that the fact that these categories exist even exist, these lies, and that's our job here, is the strangest thing, I've been thinking about this this week, is that what we're trying to do is weave truth out of lies. The threads of racial and of many of these other identities, gender identities, are basically lies, and yet we are having to knit them together to create a truth. And that's just a contradiction we have to live in because that's the world we live in. But the reason that these categories exist is because of the greatest, one of the greatest failures in human history, and that's the failure, the doomed effort to domesticate humans. After the cow and the pig, the alpaca and the goat, the chicken and the sheep were domesticated, the rulers of the tiny empires of those days set out to domesticate people. Passive populations were needed to bring in the grain, to dig the mines and quarry the stones, and that effort has been going on now for about 300 generations, and it isn't going well. All of those strange social formations that we call civilizations have had to keep creating even bigger systems of repression, indoctrination, and containment, such as borders, prisons, schools, and distractions to keep us from jumping barriers, escaping enclosures, tagging subway cars, overthrowing rulers, and reviving and remembering the histories and ceremonies that remind us of who we are. And divi division is one of the primary tools. If we can't be tamed, then we've got to be divided. As near as I can tell from what other researchers have done, I'm not a historian, anti-black racism and its soon-to-be-born child, white supremacy, were injected into the bloodstream of Europe in around the mid-1400s through the mechanism of Portuguese colonial expansion in Africa. That European slavery at that time, all of a sudden it was an administrative tool if you could have people as slaves in Europe who you could identify just by looking at them, you could identify their social status, that made the project of oppression and exploitation so much easier. And that was at the same time as this new religion of capitalism was starting to metastasize through the tissues of Europe before they merged to give birth to the modern colonial system. Go think about that, mid-1400s. According to the way scientists now calculate generations, that was 20 generations ago. That was 20 friggin' generations ago. You know, think about the fact that we've been sitting around fires telling each other stories for 400,000 years. Those 20 generations ain't shit, right? This is, that's long enough to create some pretty nasty messes, but not a long enough to fundamentally change who and what we are. And for me, as somebody who in just a couple of months ago turned 63, Gemini power! Uh, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to say that out loud. Um, that means that I have been around to witness 10% of that history. I've been around for 10% of the entire lifespan of capitalism. Perspective changes everything. <laughs> 
And now, as the colonial capitalist era is, is approaching its expiration date, of course, it's naturally that we start, naturally we start redefining the rules of the game. Okay. I know you're there. I know just, I know you're there, Alyssa. I know you. Um, the guardians of greed cannot conceal where they are leading. On an endless escalation of an earth-destroying curse, but the ancestors demand that I declare without retreating that the wound will not be healed until the crime has been reversed. So, it's important to become comfortable with silence, unless you work in radio. In which case, you become comfortable with being uncomfortable. So, I think what I want to bring this toward um, is that when I was a teenage activist, immigrant child, I did, we all struggled with identity. This is nothing new. But identity then was seen as a necessary stepping tone so, towards solidarity, which is the only force strong enough to bring down an empire. That was before being an ally was non-profitized. Being an ally in the age of the national liberation movements meant that Colombia was in solidarity with Guinea-Bissau, which was in solidarity with Vietnam, which was in solidarity with Indonesia. Before it was turned by the nonprofits, it being an ally turned into a euphemism for privileged white people help, you know, supporting oppressed people. It was also before the nonprofit system over 40 years slowly transformed identity from a stepping stone to solidarity into a brand and brands exist only to compete with each other. So that's the invisible hand of the nonprofit market. But these processes of co-optation are just what happens on the edges of wetlands and ecosystems, right? It's just a natural process, and it's not our destiny. The world belongs to no one and by no one can be taken. It's the wonder of creation that's bestowed on us at birth, a seed of transformation that is destined to awaken in the thunder of a memory released upon the earth. So what I'd like to do is close once again with a quote from my sister on the condition that I find it. And I, say, I read this as closing because histories of betrayal are always centered in what we learn about each other. And histories of solidarity are not merely forgotten, they're suppressed and sedated and eradicated until we can only imagine betrayal and loss and we assume that hopefulness always ends, ends in disappointment. Aurora says, to live a life of audacity, dwelling in the place where joy meets justice year after year, can only be sustained by being so in love with a vision of what's possible that we no longer flirt with despair. For 400,000 years, we've been sitting around fires. We kind of worked it. We, we never domesticated fire either, by the way. Fire is a lot like us. We work out a deal, but we can't turn our back, right? It's got a, a life of its own and a spirit of its own. And it allowed us to stay up past our bedtimes, tell stories, cook food, be warm and be safe. And that's really where our greatest power and our greatest weakness comes from. Stories are the glue that holds together oppressive systems and it's also the fuel that powers resistance. And so my blessing to you for this weekend is that we be a fire, that we sit around, that we stay up past our bedtimes telling stories and that we be aware that the fire that lights and warms us creates shadows, and that we cannot be a hole around that fire until those who are in the shadows have been invited to warm themselves at the center. Thank you. <laughs>